All right, I want to get us started. So welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I am Jim Siegel. I'm a technologist with the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that serves as a catalyst for privacy leadership and scholarship in support of emerging data practices and emerging technology. And privacy enhancing technologies, or PETs, are one of the more intriguing emerging technologies that enable education agencies and other state institutions to securely share, analyze, and utilize student data with the goal of ultimately improving student and organizational outcomes. And while PETs have a, a great potential for SEAs and other state institutions when it comes to the data that they share, there's a significant uh, gap among knowledge and other resources and how these technologies might be applied and what the potential benefits are. So to examine this gap um, and the opportunities and possible pass forwards, we partnered with AEM to look at the educational agency pet landscape through research that'll be talked about in this webinar and in a report that will be released on fpf.org's website in mid-December. And with that, I will hand it over to Darren to get us started. Thank you very much, Jim, much appreciated. Welcome all, thank you again for joining us. We have a lot of content to cover, so I apologize if I, am, uh, if I seem like I'm moving swiftly, but I'm uh, excited to discuss what we have on the DACA for today. So again, just for those who have joined, we will be recording this presentation um, that is currently underway. Microphones are muted until we get to the QA portion. Encourage you to use the QA feature in your Teams viewing window to ask any questions, and of course, leverage the chat for any additional comments. So look at our agenda for the day. Uh, we're going to start with just a brief slide setting the stage a little bit more uh, building off of what Jim's already provided and then our partners over at Georgetown's Massive Data Institute will be providing us with a PETS 101 presentation. After that we'll get into our landscape analysis summarizing some of the findings from our research and focus groups and then uh, the real meat of our presentation today the PET panel discussion excited for that and then again the Q&A at the end addressing any questions that may have come through throughout the presentation. So setting the stage, um, briefly over the last several years, uh, no, it is obviously of no surprise to anybody uh, who has been looking. There have been, in a, there's been an unprecedented growth in the use, collection, storage, et cetera, of data, especially with the acceleration and developments in artificial intelligence and what that means exactly, uh, and other technological technological advancements in business intelligence tools. And at the same time, states are battling, weighing, juggling, competing priorities on top of data demands, while also trying to ensure privacy and protection of these data. Um, so the kind of the big question is, how do we safely, how do we adequately safeguard these data without sacrificing the insights that may be gleaned to improve educational outcomes, workforce outcomes, organizational outcomes? Um, that's kind of like the big question uh, of the of the day. Um, but with that, I think it's appropriate now. I will turn it over to Stephanie, who will be going through Pets 101 with us to uh, further set the stage. Thank you, Darren. My name is Stephanie Strauss. I'm a policy fellow at the Massive Data Institute at Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy. I am here to give you a quick and dirty overview of privacy enhancing technologies, PETS 101. Next slide, please. Thanks, Darren. Okay, so what are PETS? Um, I have 15 minutes to talk, so I will sort of be giving the 1000 foot view here on a topic that I could talk about for a few hours. But the high level view, what pets are, are cryptographic techniques or technologies that increase data protection while still allowing for greater data utility. Now, what does that mean? Cryptographic means that a lot of these techniques or technologies leverage some kind of encryption. Um, and that could be an encryption key where you as a data owner hold the key to decode that encryption and no one else does. Um, and they are a group of techniques or technologies. So even though we have privacy enhancing technologies, the T there stands for technologies. Some of them are actually more um, methods and I will get into that in later slides. And so what they do, what pets do are that they're not replacing um, data analysis or computation or something like that that you already do or data storage or data release, but they make these more safer, uh, they, more safer. They make these safer um, by protecting the data itself, like the data file, the rows within the data, as well as the personally identifiable information within that data. And so through various mechanism, mechanisms, these techniques and technologies 
make it a lot harder to trace back to a student's identity. Let's say students are the uh, micro level data or the rows in your data set, as well as it could be, you know, schools are the rows in your data set, whatever the unit of analysis is, pets help protect against re-identification of a student, school, teacher, et cetera, as well as any group identification. So knowing, you know, who belongs to a certain um, maybe race or ethnicity group or special education status, which is also considered sensitive information. And the nice thing about pets is that they increase this privacy protection in the ways I just outlined of your data and the data subjects within your data, um, while still allowing you to use it in the same ways. So you can still analyze, you can still link, you can still share, you can still release outputs to the public. So it doesn't compromise the use because right now there's a tension between often between utility and privacy protection. Um, you know, you might have to, in order to protect the privacy of this small student group, suppress uh, a cell in a tabulation. And that would mean, you know, there's less utility because you suppress that statistic and it's not there. So pets offer a really nice balance of that privacy utility, often what's considered a trade-off. And so, yeah, once again, they can complement existing methods that you have. So suppression, other statistical disclosure limitation methods, rounding, there is nothing wrong with that. If that meets your use case and your needs, that's great. However, sometimes those methods do not meet your existing needs. And so they could be combined with pets or replaced by pets. And pets really are grounded in what I have here. Those five circles are the five safes, um, a system developed by uh, Statistics UK and um, sort of been woven into seminal data governance, you know, papers, practices over the years, um, what, can, what is considered the gold standard. So pets allow for safe projects, people, settings, data, and outputs. And I'm going to get into in the next slides how, um, how pets interact with these five safes. Next slide, please. So what issues are pets addressing? So I know we have K-12 higher ed uh, folks here on the call, various education data owners, and I'm sure you all are very familiar with some of these issues on here. So I've tried to compile what are some of the major um, barrier points for future data, in, uh, data insights, unlocking more data insights, sharing data, linking data, analyzing data, et cetera. We have distrusting parties. So you have your data. You may want to link with a neighboring agency or institution or data aggregator, but you both don't want to expose your sensitive information that you are protecting of your students, let's say, to each other. Um, this can also create knowledge gaps. You don't know what you don't have the answers to if you can't actually obtain the data see the data, share the data. And it doesn't always have to be across linkage. It could be, you know, you want to share data with um, a, someone who's going to do a policy evaluation or an external researcher or a nonprofit, but you are bound by your local jurisdiction's legal statutes on data sharing that says that you can only share for XXX reasons and you cannot disclose the data, let's say. Pets can help you get around that. In addition, I know I've heard this time and time again, the um, painstaking process of reaching data sharing agreements, actually getting them signed like through, you know, follow through with the DSAs can take years. Um, and that is not really sustainable if you are trying to, I don't know, do analysis in, a, in more than a couple of years into the future. Um, as well as sometimes DSAs, I've heard that they get like 90% through and then leadership changes over and then you have to start from ground one, um, wrangling the parties and trying to navigate those agreements. Now, pets may not eliminate the entire need for DSAs, but they certainly can change the language in the DSAs because the way that the data is being shared or linked or accessed, et cetera, those access controls and those privacy protections are changing in a good way. And so, you know, it has made um, getting to DSA is a little easier for some of our partners. Another issue that pets address is the need or move to copy data or PII, essentially having another carbon copy of your data set living on someone else's machine, server, et cetera. That could be dangerous, not only because then that group is, you have other eyes, other sets of eyes that you are trusting with your sensitive data. Um, they also, it's another place and location that could be vulnerable to hacks or breaches. And so ideally you want to 
I'm sure a lot of you want to minimize how many copies of your data and PII are living in um, your universe. And finally, pets can protect against unauthorized access or inappropriate use. So there are ways to put tight access controls on who can access what, in what kind of way, where, what questions can they ask, what results can they get, um, what do those results look like. And so pets can help get through some of these, what I've heard in my work as some of these major um, education data challenges. Next slide, please. Thanks. So how pets address these issues, um, I've divided the two categories, I've divided pets into two categories. One is with input privacy and the other is with output privacy. And so when I say input privacy, I mean anything that you are doing to the data or with the data. And that could mean um, storing the data, accessing the data, analyzing it, linking it, et cetera. Think of it as being in the data. Whereas output privacy is what happens once you release data into the world. And that could be a data set itself that you are making available for public consumption or those who are maybe authorized researchers, um, or it could be statistics and tabulations that you are making available, let's say, on your organization or institution's website. So don't worry about all of this jargony words here. These are the names of pets. We use icons, um, my team and I, like throughout our presentations, but I don't expect you to remember them, uh, what they are called, nor what the icons represent, but I'm going to walk you through the basic gist of what they do and what sort of uh, use case they can help with. So the first one under input privacy, record linkage, privacy preserving record linkage. The parenthetical there is one of the more common ways of doing what is often abbreviated to PPRL. This is when you want to link across two or more distrusting parties. Um, and what it does, secure hashing, for example, takes your personally identifiable information like a sec social security number, date of birth, et cetera, and replaces it with a hash. Most simplistically, you could think of a hash like a random string of characters. And you cannot, any, no one can sort of crack that code. Um, you add sort of extra uh, gibberish to simplify so that no one can trace it back and say, oh, well, Stephanie, I see her name must have been Stephanie because for an S each time you put a pound sign. So there are algorithms that um, are a bit beyond my pay grade, but people who are writing these algorithms that make it that it, um, it cannot be reversed. And so I'm going to skip down to the secure multi-party homomorphic encryption. These are similar to a privacy preserving record linkage system, but they leverage encryption. So instead of hashing, they use public and private key uh, pairing. And that's what I was mentioning earlier, where you are the only one who has sort of the code to decode your data and neither party sees the other party's unencrypted or decrypted data. These um, last two pets only spit out decrypted aggregate statistics that you and your partner agency have agreed on beforehand. Now, on the input privacy, um, the last one here, trusted execution environment, um, also often called an enclave. Some of you may already have a secure enclave, a virtual enclave. They're sometimes called trusted research environments. And this is a virtual secure space that is often isolated from your computer or server's existing memory, so that if it were to be hacked, um, you wouldn't find any information about the data in that enclave, like the hacker would not be able to sort of trace back. Um, and these can have tighter access controls. The trusted execution environment is a bit more intense than an enclave. You can actually, in a trusted execution environment, specify what code can be run, like down to which queries can be run. Um, I have intermediaries there in italics because that is not a pet but I wanted to include it there because a lot of you may be using trusted third parties. And again, pet, non-pet, whatever meets your need, that is totally fine. A lot of these pets offer solutions if you wanna take some human eyes off of um, sort of that intermediary role. And now output privacy, we have also in italics, traditional statistical disclosure limitation, like I mentioned before, that's your rounding, coarsening, suppression, et cetera. And then you have differential privacy. And this is a mathematical formulation. So some pets are techniques and some are technologies. This is a technique. It is a mathematical formula um, created by computer scientists that actually calibrates the amount of noise. You can think of noise sort of like jiggering or mussing up your data. So in a most simplistic way, um, if you had 
200 students and that was one of your statistics, if you wanted to use differential privacy, it may add a little bit, it may subtract a little bit, and you can calibrate that noise around like statistical means and you can choose sort of how much you want to turn that dial. Um, on the other hand, synthetic data down below is an entirely new data set and um, my colleague will probably speak about that later, Jeremy. And that is where a data set is created using um, statistical algorithms as well, um, maybe decision trees, for example, that mimics the properties and the high level trends and statistical sort of trends like regressions or correlations between your existing variables, but has none of your original micro data in it. Um, and then finally, a private query server, while these are sort of like lesser used, they're still really important because what these are, some of you may be doing this already, is where someone from the outside can ask a question and then you, the data owner, run that question on your data and all you turn or like spit out or send back to the um, outside researcher, inquirer, whoever it is, is the aggregate statistics. So you'll see some themes here about sort of taking out like a man in the middle. Next slide, please. Also, I, uh, Darren, let me know how I'm doing on time if I'm uh, getting close. Okay, so how you get from here to there with pets, with similar utility but more privacy. You all have data. You want to release results. That could be tables, publications, reports, graphs, et cetera, um, and maybe a data set itself. So next slide, please. Thank you. So there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, and I'm going to map on these various ways onto existing pets. But first, let me just kind of walk through them. Protect the PII. That's the date of birth, name, et cetera. Um, social security numbers. I know a lot of K-12 data owners do not have SSNs, but that's all of your PII. You could protect the microdata to skip sort of up ahead. That's all of the rows in the data set. You could protect the setting the place in which the data is accessed and how it's accessed. You could protect the querying process. So who's allowed to ask questions? What questions can they ask? How can they ask them? Similarly to access controls, who is accessing this data and where and what can they do? Can they download that data out of the enclave? Usually not. Um, you get to decide what can they take out of the enclave? Does it need to be vetted by you first? or you could protect the output. So the results, and that sort of goes back to the differential privacy and the output uh, privacy column there. You could noise up the results. You could make a synthetic data set and release that instead of your raw data set. Next slide, please. So here I've mapped on the various pets onto these different use cases. And so I know I have a lot of abbreviations here, but I wanted to outline what the different pets, what purpose they can serve. And it depends on your organization or institutional needs and sort of where you're getting blocked or where you're hearing the concern is from, let's say a data partner you're trying to work with. Um, so I, I won't walk through all of these, but know that they span across input and output privacy. And sometimes you may want more than one and you may want to sort of stack the pets. You may want to protect the PII, for example, as well as the setting in which that data is um, analyzed. So you could have privacy preserving record linkage and then the resulting data put into an enclave. So there are ways to sort of mix and match that fit your needs. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I want to end with uh, connecting this back to what you all do day to day. What are some of the education use cases that you might need? So if you are trying to link across agencies or institutions, maybe you are a post-secondary institute and you want to link to your local or state workforce department, um, or you are a K-12, um, you are part of the SLDS staff at a K-12 state education department, and you want to link to your state juvenile justice or um, social services department. On the right are some pets that you could use. You could use that record linkage, that privacy preserving record linkage I mentioned. Uh, HE stands for homomorphic encryption, SMC, secure multi-party computation. Again, this sort of jumble of words is less important. What's more important is the function that they serve. So with HE, SMC, you can link with your partners without either partner ever having to see the other's underlying PII and raw data. And you both agree 
upon the queries that you want to be run. Like, let's find the overlap of records or students in our data set and then compute averages on XYZ. Um, and that's all that will come out decrypted. And for PPRL, you can link in a way that both of you agree to apply a secure hashing algorithm, let's say, and that just replaces all the sensitive personally identifiable information with hashes and it stays that way. The PII does not go back in. Now, some of you may need to train data for your dev teams or for new applications. Um, a lot of you probably work with ed tech vendors. And so whether this is an ed tech vendor that is external and they are asking for, you know, can we see data first to even show you what we could do with your data given our app or tool or whatever it is. Um, you also may have people internal to your organization who may not currently have access to your data. Um, and this would require sort of uh, a heavy lift in terms of data governance work there to get them access. But could they use a data set that still retains the properties of that raw data set, all the statistical trends, um, sort of like for individual variables, the univari univariate distributions, maybe similar race, ethnicity, um, part-time versus full-time status and enrollment trends, but is not the same exact data. So Stephanie Strauss in the raw data set would not also appear in the synthetic data. So that's, um, that's one option in addition, or sorry, instead of having to give the original data set. Uh, finally, or not finally, second from finally, a lot of you get micro data requests from researchers and beyond researchers, external requesters. Um, this last one's kind of split in two. So this does focus a bit more on those who need more than just aggregate statistics. Um, you can have synthetic data like I just described before. You could give them that data and they could still use it to get important insights from the data. Um, you could also use a private query server where you have researchers ask you a question and then you are the only one who has access to your backend data and then you send them back the aggregate statistics. Or you could set up an enclave, and I know some of you on the call already have systems like this, um, where you have the access controls over who can access it, when, how, what they can do with it. And finally, when you have data requests from legislators, the media, public, that may be more suited to aggregate statistics, they can get, you know, they really just need percentages, means, et cetera. You can use the private query server and you can also use differential privacy. Next slide, please. Ah. There we go. Well, thank you. Um, I hope this gave you a little bit of a taste of what privacy enhancing technologies can do. And with that, I will pass it off to the next speaker. Much appreciated. And thank you to our colleagues at Georgetown's Massive Data Institute uh, for helping us frame this conversation as we dive into our landscape analysis. So um, given that the stage has not been properly set, we're going to spend the next couple of minutes, several minutes before a panel discussion, delving into some of our analysis findings from our research and state engagement. So the objective of this landscape analysis was to build a more complete understanding of pets adoption, as well as uh, the state of pet implementation across state education agencies and that landscape. To achieve this, we first examined existing literature and research that was out there, including academic papers, reports, use, case, use cases, case studies that contributed to the broader picture of pet implementation in education, as well as in the broader, you know, big data industry, big data domain. And then to contextualize these findings, we collected qualitative data via focus groups consisting of state education leadership staff, implementers, their partners, as well as interviews with industry leaders and subject matter experts. And we did this to, you see these bullets here, um, assess the knowledge and awareness and see where what RPTs do folks know? Are they using them? If they are using them and they have real world application, what are some of the successes, lessons learned, considerations? And then for those who have not adopted or exploring, what are some points of confusion or barriers uh, that might exist that are hindering adoption um, or perhaps hindering a PET that has been implemented from working to its fullest capacity. So we wanted to look first at opportunities and realized benefits of pets according to the research. Stephanie covered some of this earlier. The uh, pets provide a means through which personal data can be kept secure without impacting the utility of those data. This means that data can be used to answer those important research questions uh, without compromising the security or privacy of this information. 
And a, a key opportunity I wanted to speak to uh, in bullet two is how technologies like pets may be leveraged to augment and in some cases even replace existing traditional techniques uh, that exist or are active in your organizations or agencies, therefore thereby enabling further analysis of these data without them quote unquote leaving home, that data ownership piece that Stephanie covered. Uh, and again, this further speaks to the remaining bullets about um, a more secure collaboration with your partners, as well as improved outcomes, whether learning outcomes and educational outcomes or organizational outcomes. Uh, and while it's not explicitly stated on this slide, also wanted to take a moment to note that uh, while PETs for some may be, you know, a daunting task, um, one of the the things that we found was, um, you know, a perception of PETs being rigid or inflexible. Um, and the depending on your use case, open source options do exist. Uh, they provide, you know, that added level of transparency while maintaining their security and of course the customizability. So developers allowing de developers to go in and modify and adapt to the technology currently in place to meet specific privacy requirements at your agency, within your state, et cetera. So now that we talked about considerations, before we get into what the uh, states had to say, um, talking about what could possibly be a challenge, things to consider when adopting, implementing these technologies. So uh, I find it helpful to think about these technologies existing across a spectrum in terms of the level of sophistication. We'll talk about this more in our findings, uh, but they can be challenging to not only implement and integrate into existing systems, but uh, maintain. And with this sophistication comes a level of complexity and that requires resources. We're not just talking dollars, we're talking people, hours, technical expertise to ensure sustainable implementation once in place. Um, not to mention potentially having to divert resources from other priorities and projects to address this complexity. Uh, lastly, of note on this slide, um, the regulatory, navigating the regulatory environment or legal landscape as it relates to pets and the disconnect therein due to a um, due to a lack of clear guidance and standards, keeping in mind not only the student privacy laws in play, but also the federal landscape. And, you know, thinking back to a little bit of the, the Pets 101, these PETs, if I were to summarize this slide um, and the one preceding it, Pets may be an effective solution, but they should not be considered the solution. Um, they are not uh, the magic wand that you have been searching for since your time in education. Um, and I, you know, I recognize that that's a bit ironic to say, considering that the I noticed the fixed graphic in the upper right hand corner eerily resembles a wand, but that was unintentional, I assure you. Um, but you know, these PETs offer opportunities. They need to be, they have considerations that come with them uh, that need to be fully fleshed out and discussed with your specific teams prior to adopting, prior to implementing, um, and, you know, should not be used to, the intention should not be to circumvent uh, some of this regulatory environment in the space, uh, but rather to aid, augment, complement your existing privacy safeguards to ensure that level of security while also allowing for analysis. Okay, um, so the state of state. So with Pets 101 and the what research has to say kind of in our rear view right now, we're gonna switch gears to what states and subject matter experts offered up in our focus group interviews. So for the purpose of our PET analysis, we investigated three major domains. Uh, they are understanding and awareness, implementation considerations, constraints. So we'll take a look at a summary of these findings and then get into recommendations. Um, also just want to note that high level overview of some of the findings highlighting key pieces here, uh, a more detailed of course version will be completed in the final report. Uh, so before moving on, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't thank all of the state education leaders, their skilled teams, uh, PET experts and researchers in the field for their participation and contributions throughout this analysis. So for those of you in the audience, thank you very much once more. Okay, so understanding and awareness. So throughout our focus groups, uh, you know, we kind of had a, a, a flow of information, if you will, of how uh, we wanted the conversation to go first, starting with generally, are you familiar with pets? What do you know about pets? And uh, it was pretty consistent, this level of expressed uncertainty about what constitutes a PET and whether certain 
uh, information, sorry, whether certain privacy safeguards that are guarding this sensitive information qualify as PETs. And as the discussions evolved, folks with PET experience chimed in. Uh, we did identify that a lot of these active privacy measures were in fact uh, privacy enhancing techniques that were referred to earlier. So for example, trusted third parties or data intermediaries, and then statistical disclosure limitation methods, which include aggregation, rounding, and cell suppression. Uh, one of the, uh, I, I like the quote in the bottom here. Um, so the, the limited PET experience those with it showed did show an interest and appetite for learning more about relevant use cases and uh, application of PETs. And I, why I like this quote is that it not only speaks to the need to raise awareness, but also a little bit to a sense of community, which we're going to get a little bit into in our recommendations that peer to peer learning between states with uh, similar technologies and advancements. Implementation considerations. The most widely discussed, also included in the list uh, provided prior, um, secure enclaves or trusted execution environments, uh, secure hashing, differential privacy, and synthetic data. These were the most widely discussed and of interest across our focus groups. While experience with these technologies varied, there were some consistencies, some patterns that we could identify. Um, one being that states with operational pets indicated the initial time commitment at the point of adoption to achieve future efficiency. So it is an investment. Absolutely, it should be viewed as such. And um, those with implementation experience highlighted the importance of leadership buy-in and adaptability. I, we will speak to this uh, further on, but I'll, I'll note it here that this adaptability, this flexibility, not only in the technology, but in your teams was, again, it was uh, consistent across focus groups, whether it was individuals who were implementing PETs or individuals in the states who had considered or were interested in uh, implementing these types of technologies that maybe lacked that level of flexibility, um, you know, in their program, each state is different, meeting states where they're at, et cetera. Uh, every use case is going to be different. So having a firm grasp and understanding of what your use case is so you can answer the why of PETs is an important step in this as well. Constraints. Um, so I uh, initially, before when working with the agenda, I was going to shoot up a quick uh, poll. Just was curious what the folks in the audience would assume the constraints would be, the most prevalent constraints would be. But for the sake of time, they were uh, awareness, a lack of awareness, resources, and technical capacity, which I don't think would come as a surprise. It supported our initial hypothesis consistent with the research. What I did find interesting, we did find interesting, was that uh, the perception sur surrounding PETs uh, so in adopting them, there were uh, there was hesitancy regarding the utility of such technologies to effective and accurately produce results in response to data demands, known as also Stephanie touched on it, the trade off that trade off between privacy and utility or usability of these data produced. Again, I think this speaks back to knowing your use case, and it's why states want to hear from one another. They want to engage with one another around not just privacy and ANSI technologies, but anything, learning what others are doing in the space, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and we mentioned the open source offerings that are available, speaking a little bit to cost for ones that are not those uh, with actively implementing PETs, while they may have realized the benefits did know the dollar value attached to at cost services and found it particularly interesting. Again, this is uh, consistent with research that states indicated that even if it was free, there are other things that have to go into this, other resources, a level of technical expertise that is just not there in all places. Um, so learning more about the successes of those implementing those open, those open source options and how that has been maintained, how success has been, how that has been sustained um, is important. So regardless of cost, there is that level of ownership and sustainability that is required. So we looked at those three overarching very quickly and swiftly. Um, Want to get into following our rules of three here. Uh, wanted to get in recommendations of which there are three, and then we'll get into our panel discussion. So recommendations raise awareness. This has been consistent across this presentation. Um, these are not trivial. These are not trivial investments, trivial pursuits. They take a lot of time and, and care. Um, so two main bullets, and again, this is just scratching the surface of recommendations um, based on our findings as well as findings from previous research, but establish a common vocabulary. 
when we were having these conversations about privacy enhancing technologies versus techniques, um, secure enclave, trusted execution environment, input privacy, output privacy, there was a lot of, um, I shouldn't say a lot, there was, but there was notable, I think there was notable uh, resistance or hesitancy just in even engaging in the conversation around some of these because we weren't sure if we were speaking the same language. So that further reinforces the need for a common vocabulary to streamline this understanding before doing anything else. It's the logical step one. Uh, and then collecting curate use cases. We've spoken to this as well throughout this presentation. So that real world application, and there are examples of that out there in the space across P20W systems, uh, specific in K12 as well, um, just post-secondary. So collecting and curating those use cases to identify where the results yielded from traditional methods maybe could be approved upon uh, and also for and where they maybe cannot be improved upon the the question of why is very important here um, and it's a good segue into the next level of recommendations being uh, technical assistance or uh, targeted assistance and what problem were we trying to solve with PETs? The why is a, was a common refrain among interviews and focus groups, and achieving this requires a better sense of how and where PETs might fit. So recommendations from that, as, that end of the spectrum, uh, PET readiness model. So a tool in which states could walk through and determine what are the conditions in my agency, organizational, technical, institutional, um, cultural even, uh, to weigh potential implementation and whether or not it is appropriate uh, now or in a future state. And then linked to that is a focus on capability. So with this readiness, what are the capabilities required to enable the certain PETs best based on my use case? I do think uh, based off of our findings, it comes down to what is your use case, knowing the why prior to embarking on this uh, this implementation or this PET journey, if you will, is very important. It's critical. Uh, last, in terms of recommendations, certainly not least, build a, a sense of community around this. So you all, I'm sure, are very familiar. You are all uh, with you know initiatives out there, groups, COPs. There are opportunities for you to connect with your peers across states, across the nation, uh, to engage in conversations about certain innovations, progress, uh, whatever it might be, you're all involved likely in them in some way or another, leveraging these existing networks to further drive conversation and innovation as it relates to PETs and sharing that knowledge transfer piece that we keep talking about, uh, sharing in between states to see what worked and what didn't work and bringing in voices from the outside. Researchers are obviously very much involved in this process. And just as your internal folks, for example, may need to be trained up when you're implementing such technologies. Researchers, partners may also require some training. What is their, what are their capabilities, their expertise? So keeping that in mind when we're looking at the, the full landscape of PETs, the types, and what might fit best. Okay, um, that was uh, a lot very quickly. Uh, thank you for, for sticking with me here. Um, now we're going to get into our PET panel discussion. So I invent our panelists to uh, to please come off camera if you're able. While uh, our panelists get situated here, uh, I encourage you all to leverage the Q&A feature. Once I stop sharing screen, I'll be able to access that and uh, we'll continue monitoring, but leverage the Q&A feature for any questions. Um, and then if you wanna drop them in chat as well, but if we could get them all in QA, that would help streamline some of the responses. And again, we'll leave time at the end for some Q&A from the audience if there are any questions. Give me one moment. So uh, our panelists uh, here up on the screen. Um, so I'm just going to ask, our panelists in attendance to please provide your name, role, agency, and then the primary responsibility related to PETs, education data, privacy in general. Um, just a quick one to two sentences would be great. So I'll pass it over to you, Katie. Hi there. Um, I'm Katie Weaver Randall, and I'm the director of Washington's Education Research and Data Center. Uh, which is the entity that houses Washington State's preschool through education through workforce um, data system. And I'm responsible, among other things, for uh, overseeing the implementation 
of the PETs uh, used primarily around output privacy, so the products that we, we put out. We uh, collaborate very closely with the systems group as well as our agency level IT to manage the input privacy aspect of our work, but I'm responsible for the output privacy. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Seaman. I'm a research associate in the Data Governance and Privacy Group at the Urban Institute and an uh, adjunct professor at the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research. So I do research on pet supplementations and pet supplementation barriers, and I develop tools, open source software, technical assistance to programs, and other sorts of resources that people can use to sort of limit those barriers to adoption that Darren was talking about in those last slides. So I've done a lot of work for federal statistical agencies, such as those housed in the National Science Foundation, U.S. Census Bureau, and I do a lot of work with state longitudinal data systems. Excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. And Julia. Hi, my name is Julia Blair. I'm General Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer at the California Office of Cradle to Career Data. We're a relatively new longitudinal data system everything from birth through the workforce. So we have over 10 um, state level data providers and I provide support to all of our different divisions. So everything from our IT infrastructure to our data programs, I'm responsible for our privacy program, but also responsible for supporting um, our data researchers and our infrastructure team as they integrate um, security and privacy measures into the work that they're doing. Excellent, thank you very much. Give me one moment. I'll just stop sharing. Um, also, just want to note a uh, I saw a question come in regarding the QA feature. Um, if it's not working for folks, please just feel free to drop them in the chat function that is available. Just don't want to create any unnecessary barriers here. Um, so but thank you for bringing that to the attention. If you if it is available, please feel free to use it. Um, OK, so thank you all for joining us here, thanking our panelists for offering up their time. I uh, think it would be fitting first, you all touched on it a little bit briefly, your P, your pet experience and implementation, but to kick off the discussion, uh, I think it makes sense to first cover at a high level the varying experiences among this panel. So specifically for you, Jeremy, before turning it over to our states, um, some of the prevalent PET types that you have either observed out in the wild or investigating further, it'd be good to learn a bit, little bit about that and you know, to aid in understanding if you could, um, don't spend too much time on it because we already did it, but if you wanted to define any terms that maybe weren't covered related to PET types, that would be great as well. Sure. So sort of similar to what Katie mentioned, I do a lot of work in output privacy. So I think about how different education data holders are able to make different kinds of data, usually in longitudinal data systems or sort of complex data infrastructures, more available in different settings. And we have a partnership right now with the state of Nebraska to start piloting a lot of these new technologies, in particular focusing on synthetic data and soon to be some validation or verification servers. And the use cases particular to SLDSs are often around expanding access to data that can make contracting easy simply because these sorts of systems require a lot of negotiation between different parties that have different obligations with how they work with data and what they're expected to do to build their systems, as well as expanding data to potential researchers who want to use that for, say, program evaluation or any other need that people might have with that sort of data. That's great. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Um, turning it over to our state. So in terms of the PETs that you're currently actively implementing uh, in your agencies or exploring, would be curious to learn any more about that from what you've already shared. And feel free to include any background in this case about how these technologies came to be in your state, um, how buy-in was achieved, et cetera. Uh, Katie, I'll start with you. Okay, great. Um, so I think this has been mentioned several times, but one approach doesn't meet all needs. And ERDC has a number of different use cases on that output privacy side. Um, there's work that we do where we provide public displays or reporting of data that takes one approach. We also provide uh, record level data files to uh, researchers or other entities that are doing audit and evaluations. So we have a number of different use cases and I think our uh, approach and the types of PETs that we've adopted have changed over time depending on the use cases. Um, so 
uh, one of the things um, that we've really grown over the past couple of years has been our education data enclave. Um, in 2021, uh, ERDC began to offer an education data enclave as a way for uh, researchers or data requesters to access uh, record level data or data that is aggregated but not suppressed. Um, and we were very fortunate uh, in that our state legislature supported uh, the development of the enclave, both through, through a statute that included enclave language and then also subsequent funding. So that has been a recently adopted um, PET that has taken us a few years to roll out, and I'll talk about some of the challenges and benefits later. Um, but we also uh, use a statistical disclosure limitation methods, suppression, redaction, rounding, top and bottom coding for the public display of information or when we provide uh, specific uh, data files to requesters when um, aggregate uh, redacted data will meet their need. Um, the other piece that we are exploring um, and we haven't developed a, a good use case yet for is synthetic data. So again, we really try to figure out what is use case, what's the problem we're trying to solve here, and is this an appropriate approach to do that? So that's one thing that might be on our horizon. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Julia. Okay, so I'll start by saying that we're still building our data system in California. We ingested over a billion data points for the first time in the fall of last year, and we're still developing our outputs based on that ingested data. So some of the um, pets that we're currently using or exploring, we have a zero trust um, architecture um, for our infrastructure. Um, we do use synthetic data for some of our modeling that we're looking at as we're building dashboards and um, our query builder. And um, we are currently going out to look at vendors for differential privacy solution. Um, we are figuring out what our secure data enclave is going to look like for our research request process. Um, I think those are the primary things that we've been working on and what we're um, continuing to work towards. Great, thank you all. And um, so, Moving from now that the piece about just generally uh, curious about challenges, um, so specific obstacles that you may have faced in adopting, implementing, exploring. Uh, these could be people related, process related systems or otherwise, but any hurdles that you might have encountered along your journey or are currently tackling. Um, I will actually I'll, I'll keep it with our state folks. So Katie, please. Certainly. Um, I'll address the education data enclave uh, first. Um, we um, adopted that in 2021, uh, but our use was really at zero. Um, and it's just been over the past two years where we have really increased usage where now we're at capacity in our enclave um, because we had a lot of challenges um, uh, helping our researchers, data requesters sort of understand the benefit of the enclave. Uh, they really saw the challenges that it posed for their uh, processes uh, for analyzing data, for collaborating around analysis and report writing, um, et cetera. Um, so we really had to exp express and sort of prove the benefits and address some of the specific barriers. Um, a key thing for us was demonstrating uh, how they could still do their business process in the enclave and also demonstrating that um, when they requested for their output, so for their data results to be exported, um, the ERDC would be responsive in our review because part of our enclave process is before any results can be exported, they need to be reviewed for appropriate um, re redaction, suppression, et cetera. And there were concerns that, that we wouldn't meet those, those timely requests. So um, addressing those requests was important. It also posed challenges for ERDC. We had to change our business practices. We have a new uh, data sharing agreement template. We had to re-examine our requirements for things like data destruction because we were no longer shipping it out via MFT. 
Um, and we had to change some of our staffing and business processes to support um, registering researchers in the enclave and also doing that review process. Um, so uh, some challenges there, but also some some significant benefits. Um, one is it really promotes collaboration between researchers um, and ERDC around technical assistance with the data. If they're encountering a problem or a question or they're seeing something they don't understand, we can collaborate in the enclave on that project. Um, it has also been a key factor in us being able to move forward some very um, difficult data sharing uh, use and agreement negotiations. Um, many of our data contributors um, are much more comfortable knowing that the data is housed in this secure virtual environment instead of being sent out to individual uh, research uh, organizations. Um, I would just quickly like to address the statistical disclosure, disclosure limitations one of the challenges we face there is coordinating across our state education agencies in Washington state. We all have slightly different practices and guidelines for doing that, all trying to meet the same intent, which is to not accidentally disclose student identities, but that alignment and um, communicating that to our consumers of our data products has been challenging. I'll stop there uh, because of time. Thank you, Katie. Much appreciated. Julia. OK, so um, I can think of several different challenges we had. I'll go back to the way in which our data system was created. We went through a rigorous planning process in 2019 to 2020. I was working for um, one of our current data providers at the time, so I sat on the legal subcommittee, but we had security, infrastructure, data um, analytics subcommittees. So a lot of um, really detailed outputs came from that planning process before the statute was even written to create our entity. And as everybody knows, things change really rapidly. So we're trying to now, you know, consider some of the um, protocols and procedures and plans that were made in the planning session, but adapt to what has changed either legally or with technology. So that's one problem. Um, another one is just the nature of being a state entity. We have to go through public contracting process. Um, we also have a um, three boards that we work with, our governing board and two advisory boards. And so a lot of the decisions that happen uh, for the data system go through our governance process, which just means that it takes time. We have meetings that happen on regular schedules, that sort of thing. Um, as I think Katie sort of mentioned, there is some tension between the excitement and um, enthusiasm about what can be done with the data, but also um, wanting to make sure that we're meeting all of our security and privacy requirements and protocols. Um, we have a security policies task force where all of our data providers sit and so we meet every other month and they have to sign off on any of the new technologies or procedures that we're talking about um, using for the data and then third one of the challenges is balancing i think public trust and transparency that's one of our core values so we really want to be transparent with the public but there is some uh, tension between concerns that individuals have about their individual privacy just in general when it comes to a longitudinal data system. So really trying to walk that balance of ensuring that the public feels like we're adequately protecting their privacy and also explaining the benefit of the longitudinal data system. That's great. Thank you, Julia. And thank you, Katie. Those were, I think those are perfect. They actually tee up Jeremy very well for it. So Jeremy, in your research and your expertise regarding the limitations, challenges around some of these PETs, I wonder if you could speak to what you have seen. Um, and then I see we have a question and given the timing, I think we shall, we'll pivot to answering that question while continuing. But Jeremy, please. Great. Yeah. Thanks to Katie and Julia for those responses. I think they cover a lot of the high level governance questions. I think from a sort of research and limitation perspective, one of the ways that that manifests is thinking about this sort of inherent trade off between making more data and more high quality data accessible and what it means to interpret all of these privacy regulations and what it means to provide that level of protection for the folks who are participating in these systems. 
And it really is a difficult communication challenge because privacy is already such a difficult concept to communicate. And when you start introducing the kinds of mathematics that pets often bring in, it can often get harder and you have to do a lot of like work to do that. I think two other things that I will add as important things to consider from the implementation side is sustainability, primarily just because there's a big difference between teeing up these systems and getting them set up in sort of preliminary stages versus, you know, as Aaron had talked about at the beginning, the investment of resources and making sure that you're able to get these systems running for a long time. And I think a lot of development in the kinds of materials and other kinds of training and educative resources to sort of teach people to fish instead of giving them fish for using it, for building these systems is really important. And I think in the interest of time, I'll stop there so we can get to some more questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate it. We are going to stick with you, however. The question, I think, uh, is fitting to, again, to your experience and your expertise regarding synthetic data and the, um, you see it there. So does that mean the requirement is that PII is scrubbed out, but the aggregate level characteristics of districts and states are somewhat preserved, even if obscured? So a little bit of a background there uh, regarding specifically synthetic data, if you could respond to that. For sure. I'm happy to answer uh, David's question in chat. So when we talk about developing synthetic data, effectively what is happening is we are creating some sort of model uh, using statistics or machine learning or any sort of technique to preserve some of the structural relationships that we want between variables in the data. But our goal is to sample from that model in such a way that things that we would consider PII or even things that could be used to reverse engineer PII are scrubbed out. Now, as we make models that are more and more complex and capture more and more relationships, some of those relationships might be closely tied to individuals. And this is where that trade-off between making data you know, useful and accessible versus having there be potential privacy risks becomes a real challenge. And synthetic data is just a, a really, really big umbrella term for any sort of technique that follows that. And it is something that can be used in tandem with a lot of these different pets that we've talked about. You can have synthetic data that uses uh, differential privacy. You can have synthetic data where you can validate the results of a particular result or for a particular question that you might answer in a private query system. So it's something that you can think of as sort of part of the toolkit that you have access to when you're developing these systems. Excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. Realizing we're tight on time, um, Julia, I did want to cover, and I know you could spend multiple, multiple minutes on this, but regarding the legal landscape as it relates to PETs, given your role as general counsel, counsel I just wanted to get your take, your experiences, and what it has been navigating that. Yes, thank you. So as I sort of mentioned in the challenges, is just the evolving landscape of legal um, requirements changing. And of course, most of our data systems, if not all, are subject to both state and federal law. So it is um, it is a unique challenge to make sure as the attorney that we're in compliance with any changing laws that are happening, um, as well as you know, ensuring that our data providers agree that we're complying with what they um, continue to view the law as changing. I will say that additionally, not to be too political, but administration changes do bring into light different privacy concerns depending on where your our state or federal administration is. And so that definitely is a challenge because I know we've been pivoting a lot recently just based on changes and potential changes in our federal government. Thank you very much. Uh, realizing that we are at time, we could spend, this easily could have been a two hour session, it feels like. I appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, thank you again to our panelists for your continued uh, participation with all of this. Um, I just want to throw some quick contact information for myself, Imogen Siegel at FPF up on the screen. If you have any questions, uh, comments, issues, whatever it might be, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Inboxes are open. Um, and then uh, panelists, uh, Julie also dropped her uh, in, her information in chat as well. Um, thank you again to Stephanie Strauss from uh, Massive Data Institute for giving that Pets 101. And with that, uh, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. So again, appreciate everybody's time. 
the recording of this will be made available. We'll make sure that uh, that is made available to all uh, all registrants and all those in attendance. And just a note that the final report for this landscape analysis uh, will probably be uh, done within the next several weeks prior to the holiday. So we'll make sure that that is available as well. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, week. Stay safe and have a good holiday.